Uh, all right. Um, I'm going to go through this uh, fast enough so that there's time for questions. Uh, I hope you've all eaten well, but not too much, so that I can still have your attention. It's always the, the first slot after lunch is sometimes a, a bit difficult one because your body will kind of go into resting mode. Uh, I have some great things to show, and uh, maybe that will uh, catch, catch you. Um, yeah, uh, just two, two things before I really start. Um, I'm an uh, architect, I'm not a scientist, so I, I can't really go into the absolute detail of the micro-mechanics uh, inside of uh, uh, unstabilized uh, rammed earth. Uh, I can probably get you some information if you have some very scientific questions on that. I'm a skilled craftsman in form of a carpenter. Um, I have studied uh, timber engineering and uh, I've done uh, a lot of years of architecture already. Finished my master's two years ago and now I'm working with Lim Ton Erde. Um, so that just with the background. Um, then one more thing before I start, sort of a provocative one, but uh, I won't go uh, to pick a fight today. Um, we were quite uh, specific about labeling uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland and in, in Germany. Uh, and if you uh, you know, uh, have ideals uh, of sustainability and renewable and, uh, what does it say again? Uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, you should really take it by, your, uh, by the things that you're naming it and uh, using cement is not to the full extent a uh, sustainable way of building. And uh, so w we've labeled it dirty concrete in, in, uh, in Europe uh, because it's using dirt and cement and you make dirty concrete. So it's no, no judging of the material, but it's, it's compounds. Okay, um, I'll get started and uh, hope to go through as fast as possible. Um, some of you might know this uh, image. Uh, it's also in uh, some of the publications that we've done. This is uh, Martin Rauch's uh, private home. And uh, it's been standing now uh, longer than 10 years, I think, uh, 2008. Now we have nearly 2018, so yeah. Um, the way that I came to, to work for Martin was uh, 2007, um, while I was studying timber engineering. I got really interested in architecture, and uh, I have a very close friend, Anna Heringer. She's an architect that works a lot with uh, Martin. Uh, she won the um, Aga Khan Prize for a school in Bangladesh, which she uh, built also uh, made of earth and bamboo. She was uh, very successful in uh, publishing this project and had a high level of participation during that. And uh, she's a close friend. And she told me, go work for Martin, you'll learn more than in any architecture school. Well, so I did my uh, uh, a volunteer work of uh, six months with Martin. I think it went really well. Uh, uh, because uh, two months before I, s I finished uh, my architecture uh, studies, uh, he called me and told me it's time to come work. So uh, that's why I started. <laughs> uh, Martin is really inspirational and uh, he's... Uh, uh, you know, he's got so much uh, feel for material and also for architecture that it really catches you uh, quickly. And uh, we are close friends. We're not you know, just, he's not my boss and I'm his, his uh, uh, worker. Uh, we're friends. And uh, a lot about uh, working with uh, this material in a natural way is about communication, feeling, a lot of uh, bodily feeling, uh, but also speaking and understanding with your clients, with your architects, with your specialists, whoever you're confronted with. Martin's done very well with that. Uh, he's teaching at uh, universities. We do workshops all the time. We have uh, a lot. I do uh, tours of uh, rammed earth architecture around our workshop and in the region with students every two weeks or so. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a daily, daily thing. Um, just some stats that uh, we are up, uh, well, Trying to expand our company, we have some difficulty because uh, we are right now working from one project to the next and they're so complicated that <coughs> the next one's already you know, on the doorstep and we can never really adapt our, our, our structure to, to really you know, get someone 
to know the, the the stuff that he needs to to really be incorporated well. So yeah, that's kind of a tough thing right now. But uh, we've already had more than 50 people working for us, and they've also you know returned to wherever they came from and and started their own thing. And uh, I mean. It takes a lot of uh, time to make these experiments and, and get this knowledge, but it's possible. And uh, you can do it you know, without really a lot of help. When I was doing the, the, the tests, it was all hand work. You, know, you could do it in your backyard, on your uh, front porch all the time. So there's no, don't hesitate to try it out. The earth is free. Uh, the cement isn't, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> Leben ton Erde, uh, we actually compose of two companies. We do that because of uh, um, 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 uh, the reasons uh, uh, is because sometimes when we wa uh, work abroad, it's easier to have a company that's separated from us, at least uh, financially wise. So uh, I'll just list up. Uh, this is what we do in our workshop. Small prefab elements, prefab ovens and stoves, wall elements, interior cladding, special framework. We work on machinery design for producing prefab elements. Uh, we do products produced in small series, planning, um, rammed earth flooring, objects in public spaces, arts and design, and a lot of research and knowledge transfer. I mean, those things are not really <coughs> paid for well, <laughs> but we do it a lot. Um, and then we have Erden. Erden is sort of like our, our daughter company. We, we say Tochter uh, uh, Firma. Uh, that's why I translate it directly. But it's alongside of us. And they, uh, this company carries out the, the bigger project, the international ones. It's actually a subcontractor to us. Uh, we do the planning. And they ha that's where the main manpower is employed. But in, it's just a... Yeah, uh, it's written in contracts, but it's all the same people. I just want to explain that we kind of split it up in that way. All right, I'm going to start with erosion because it's uh, the major part uh, uh, what you have to start off with when you want to work unstabilized. Um, this building, and I know it quite precisely, uh, I went there, um, is uh, nearly uh, uh, 950 years old. There's all the rammed earth buildings worldwide. And as you can see in the background, erosion and erosion on the building and the color of the earth and uh, the coloring of the uh, building, it's all the same. It happens and it's a natural process. It happens with our bodies. We erode too in a way. Uh, and uh, if you can accept this natural process in your building uh, in techniques uh, and accept it, on you as well, then uh, you're ready to go uh, and, and, and experiment uh, because trying to annihilate erosion is not going to get you anywhere happy with unstabilized rammed earth. We're very happy that we don't stabilize because uh, it enables us to prefab in general and uh, make jointless uh, walls. Uh, we get rid of the joints and we produce 100 meter, 200 meter long walls without any expansion joint. We can fix them all up. If someone uh, drives into the wall or breaks pieces off, we can fix that wall. We can reactivate the material and stuff in new material. And I think those are really, really good uh, arguments to try it out, at least. Uh, we are doing rammed earth, or Martin and his company are doing rammed earth since 30 years now, and we're doing it on a big international scale, and we're making money off it. And is working good for us. Um, I'm not going to argue against making money with uh, stabilized uh, rammed earth because you guys seem to be also doing well, at least some of you, with it. And uh, that's OK for me. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through some projects and try to explain as much uh, as possible about the techniques and so on. I'm also going to focus a little bit more on the erosion part and also on the climate uh, adaptiveness of uh, prefabbed uh, rammed earth elements, because that's also the title of the talk in the uh, schedule that you have. Uh, but um, I want to show you as much as possible. I mean, most of these things can be viewed online uh, also. Um, and uh, I'll just go into some of the details on it. Uh, so this uh, freestanding, unstabilized rammed earth wall is in front of our workshop. It's, uh, it was built in uh, 1992. And uh, it was a, a big test for Martin to try things out. It has a rounded uh, a stone uh, aggregate in it. 
and uh, not too much of it. Uh, we've, uh, by time, increased uh, the part of aggregates, stone aggregates, by a lot. Um, but this is still standing since uh, uh, nearly 20, no, more than 20 years now. Uh, 2012 would be 20. So it's, uh, it's 26 years now, nearly, right? 25. 25, yeah. Okay, and you can see that there, there's some parts missing to it, and that's because this uh, pathway is directly on the way to school for a lot of school kids, and they uh, keep scratching out uh, some of the stones that, that are on the surface. Uh, but looks quite fair for that. I mean, there's been generations of school kids passing by, so uh, it's a fair wall as a, you know, just a test wall or screening wall. It still looks quite nice. And uh, there was also some graffiti on it. There's some uh, parts left of it here. Uh, Martin just took a, a, a rough broom and just uh, broomed the graffiti off. Uh, didn't even use water, so uh, works well with that. Also, um, yeah, this is another image. You can see that uh, uh, here he didn't take too much time about uh, brushing off the, the or, or, or making the uh, joint between the formwork disappear. You can see the formwork boards here. They're about um, two meters seventy long and 60 centimeters high. Uh, but uh, with time of erosion, these uh, joints have mostly disappeared because uh, this natural erosion actually makes the joints erode away. So, um, Yeah, Martin got, got um, attention and uh, he applied as an artist because he is actually no studied architect. He's a, uh, he studied ceramics. Um, so he applied for this competition where um, um, there was, uh, the point of this competition was to uh, place artwork inside this uh, architecture of, the, uh, this is a hospital, and it has a long curved um, uh, glass uh, winter garden, and it's in Feldkirch, the next city next to the workshop. And uh, Martin wanted to have a, a, um, a piece of art, but that would have the, the effect of, um, um, keeping the inside atmosphere nice and comfortable. And this wall, um, you know, it, it uh, sucks up the heat when the sun is shining in. It uh, absorbs the moisture and regulates the moisture inside here. Uh, it will, uh, it's, uh, you can cool it with uh, cold water uh, so that if there's a lot of heat collecting inside the winter garden, it, it actually cools. And uh, in that way, it works in a different, uh, in another level next to the being a piece of art. Um, next project is uh, uh, that came because he, he, he got the attention. It was pub uh, published quite a few times, that wall in the hospital. A lot of people could touch it. It was a public space. Uh, a lot of people experienced it, touched it, felt the, the temperature, uh, um, and, and were convinced. Uh, and told that to other people. And so he got this uh, contract for um, a zoo building in Basel in Switzerland uh, for the Itasha house. And Itasha is, a, is an area in Namibia, uh, which uh, is a very deserty area. Uh, and uh, they had a lot of African animals in that, in that uh, house. And uh, so that the material was perfect for it. And I'll come back to this project later. Um, you have to look into the book uh, if you want to see more images uh, concerning the projects or go uh, on our website um, and uh, then because I have to go through a few things. Well, anyway, uh, it continued on to that chapel that was mentioned also by Luigi. Uh, it was a breakthrough for Martin because uh, uh, he, he really uh, got uh, you know, a, a building permit in Germany going, uh, which seemed far out of reach at that time, doing something in rammed earth, uh, 1990. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's now nearly 30 years ago. Um, and you can imagine a load-bearing, ram unstabilized rammed earth building in a public space, on a very important public space, because this chapel is directly on the former border between Eastern Berlin and Western Berlin. It's still visited by a thousand people a day. And uh, anyway, this competition, this architecture competition was uh, uh, 
spoken out for, for that chapel and the architects that uh, designed it were designed it in uh, steel concrete, uh, steel reinforced concrete. And there was a big problem about that. The Berlin ma uh, wall is made of uh, reinforced steel concrete. And uh, this being a chapel of reconciliation, uh, that seemed to be a problem and I think everyone can understand that. So um, the, the city council that wanted to do, build this building said uh, they wanted to build it of earth. And so there was a lot of discussions. The architects said that can't be done. Um, and uh, statical engineers said, no, that can never be done. Uh, and then uh, there was this one person that was advising the project. It was a professor at the um, Berlin University. Uh, it's Klaus Dierks. And, uh, he had seen what Martin had done also in, uh, in other, other regions and the wall in, in, uh, in the hospital. He said, well, I can advise you and I know someone who can do this. And uh, so that's how Martin came into play and it had to be done and contracted within two weeks, uh, two months. And getting permits uh, in that kind of scale at that time, <coughs> it seemed impossible to do. But with the help of Dix and I have to tell you that most breakthroughs that Martin has experienced uh, uh, are, were you know, individuals that were ready to take some risks and uh, were sort of subtle enough to, to stand up and, and really understand the material and, and, and uh, argue for it uh, because they have gained knowledge and were asking questions. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll not go deeper into that. Um, the, the inside oval is made of uh, rammed earth. Uh, it's a uh, uh, nine, nine meter high wall, uh, self-supporting, and it, it also carries the, the main part of the roof on it. Uh, the outside pillars are just to support the, the facade, which is made of uh, upright uh, wooden uh, beams. It was a um, rounded formwork that Martin actually bought uh, after this project. Um, and it, wide enough walls to, to run this machine through. It's a really fast way of compactation, but still with this half mechanization, you could still see the, the human effort uh, in the finished wall afterwards. So the formwork was uh, leveled up twice, um, uh, three times in total. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really thought through an effective way. They, they involved a lot of uh, local workers uh, from the city uh, or from the uh, church group that was uh, mainly uh, supporting this project. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a whole group of um, people that are, are revitalizing the church, were revitalizing churches after the, the reunion of Eastern and Western Germany because uh, a lot of the churches in Eastern Germany had uh, been, you know, uh, um, not really taken care of and uh, so uh, helping hands at this place came from all around Europe and uh, it was uh, it seemed to be a really difficult t task to get things coordinated but uh, with explaining just a few simple steps you could really incorporate a really big group in this uh, project and they pulled it through in a very a fair, fair amount of time and uh, got the thing going. So this is inside the formwork when you're peeling it off and it, uh, uh, for Martin, it was a, a, a big risk if the surface was going to be okay and if the mix was going to be okay, and it worked out really well. This is the finished chapel now, and you can all visit it easily if you have a time to spend in Berlin. The inside, the, the floor is also made of uh, rammed earth. Uh, yeah. Uh, Martin went on to... to uh, uh, really test some of the knowledge that he had gained up till then and in 2005 together with uh, the architect uh, Roger Bolzhauser uh, he wanted to do uh, something extraordinary and, and wanted to do something for himself and uh, he planned his own house together with uh, Roger. There's also a publication just about this house. You can order it here also in, in Australia. I looked it up and it, it tells you a lot of details of how to do low bearing walls, get lintels going, do uh, ceilings, uh, a lot of detailing. It's, it's, it has a lot of details that are hands on that can be repeated, tested out. And it's a three story load bearing house in unstabilized rammed earth. Um, 
and I think it was a real breakthrough. Uh, it was published quite a lot of time. It's a reference for rammed earth uh, globally, it seems. And uh, it's a really nice place to live in. I spent, uh, when I was working for him in 2007, um, uh, time on that construction site <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, it was uh, also being built and I came back as a volunteer to work on it and uh, when I started working I lived three months inside this house I've experienced it with my own body and uh, although Martin says uh, it's the greatest house he's ever lived in you know you want to make your own opinion I mean if you t ask someone uh, does your house work for you that you built yourself oh yeah it's the perfect house I mean everyone's gonna say that but uh, I'll support that, what he said. It's, uh, it's beautiful to live in there. Um, what's important about this house, it's a very emotional and very um, yeah, poetic uh, thing, actually. Um, Martin cut open the hill and used the material that was in that hill and compressed, the wall, uh, compressed that material into the wall, uh, wall formwork and uh, the house was finished, more or less. I'm just cutting it off a little bit. But 100% of the excavation material is in the walls. And uh, that is uh, quite, quite a, a cool thing, actually, I think. And, and uh, um, in that way, uh, you have a, a full circle of, of you know, the material, uh, material's life circle. You can excavate it, prepare it, ram it into the formwork. Once you don't need it anymore, it can deteriorate, and it will be in the place where it was before. I mean, of course, there will be some things that you need to pull out of it, like metal bars or whatever, but the main part of the material can just stay where it was before. So uh, if we talk about life cycle assessment and, and life cycle uh, of materials and so on, I think it, it has a quite, uh, quite solid uh, arguments for it. So this is the excavation site, and uh, this is the cut open hill. It's a shell rock type. Uh, this is uh, flanks of a valley uh, situation where glaciers moved through. So uh, this is uh, on the halfway up this uh, valley side walls. And that's where uh, a lot of sedimentary rock was. And uh, I'd explained this when I was mixing material and so on. You want those sharp edged stones to happen for you and have layerings of clay in between so that you get, when you crush some of this material, get the, the mix already really nicely working for you without adding too much. So he could use 100% of this material. There's nothing left out or sieved out or, or, or whatever. It was just granulated and crunched to the right bits and pieces. Uh, people thought he was crazy at that time when I looked at those images. So simple formwork. This, the, the, the architecture of the house is, is really quite simple. Easy, easy chambers stacked on top of each other with uh, you know, just the right exposition of terraces towards the, the, the places where you want to have. It has a morning terrace and an afternoon terrace and it has only one window per, per room but a prominent one and, and, and that works really well with the lintels also and you can get the, the height of the windows working with you, for you uh, where you put the ceilings and all that. It's a very simple house. Martin tells me that if, uh, if he would build it again, there's nothing that he'd really change. If he would build something like this again, he would build it even more simple. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a uh, moving formwork, uh, section for, uh, after section, uh, rammed in situ. And you see the contrast of the freshly uh, rammed material and the rough mater raw material. This is the same, one-to-one. -one. There's nothing added. added uh, you'd think there's, uh, you know, I mean, there's water added, obviously, uh, but there's no other material added to it. This is this, just in a different moisture content. So this is uh, one of the rooms in the, in, the, in the basement area, or the ground floor area, actually, because uh, the ground floor and the basement connect to each other uh, in a way because it's, you know, uh, stacked into the hillside. And uh, this is a view outside of the room to, to where, where, you know, he, he left uh, the walls a little bit um, off the, the cut open hillside to avoid the, the pressing water against the, the, the walls. So he didn't have to put bitumen in this wall down here. He just left an airspace in between and put a terrace on top with some um, uh, uh, light channels down to the bottom. 
So in this room, we have a, a first uh, ceiling construction. He made that of a T-bar steel uh, bar and has uh, bricks uh, laid in between of them. Uh, and then uh, there's a, um, a, a truss line mortar placed on top of that, reed mats to, for insulation, again a cork uh, truss earth mixture. Truss is your puzzling um, um, uh, ground uh, uh, stone uh, powder. Um, I'm no geologist, but there was some, one, somebody that might know. And then there's a rammed earth floor on top of that for the next, uh, next room above. Um, the next uh, ceiling construction in this house is uh, um, what we call dipper baum decke, and it seems to be translating to timber beam floor, which, yeah, could be right. I, I didn't translate it, but uh, it's, uh, it's a three-sided cut uh, uh, log of wood. Uh, one side is still kept rounded. You don't need to cut them all the same. These beams were cut um, just uh, 200 meters further down uh, out of a forest that belongs to the greater family of Martin. So it was a very local resource. And you can see that it spans uh, the whole uh, width of the room. Uh, there's uh, four meter logs here, but uh, there's some that in front spans uh, five meters wide. Uh, and on top of that, you can ram your rammed earth floor. There'll be no movement at all after the um, logs have reached their equilibrial um, moisture content. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's a ring beam that connects the walls at a certain height, and that's the resting place for the, the, um, the uh, timber beams. Um, this is the, uh, and Luigi also showed a photo of this, that's the um, staircase that goes up. Uh, it has up to a 60 centimeter thick uh, walls, uh, um, walls uh, in that area, and especially in the corners. It stiffens out your whole construction because it's a really solid block. And the, and the stair, uh, stair steps um, on the way are rammed in um, at, uh, at, at the height where they need to be and are rammed in or st stuck in, I think, 30 centimeters deep. So, yeah, this is the image that you already saw. Um, for certain areas, um, Martin's wife and his son, they work together on these um, um, tiles, and we sell those also. They've kind of now separated from our main company, begin doing their own business, and his son has uh, become independent with them, uh, doing very well. Uh, yeah, this is the house from outside. And I'm just going to go uh, quickly into detail to to do my uh, actual objective of talking about thermal activation. Uh, you can uh, the the thermal activation of unstabilized rammed earth is uh, a lot more effective than the thermal insulation of stabilized rammed earth, and a lot more ex uh, uh, effective than the uh, the activation of con uh, steel concrete. Uh, the thing is that the the potential to store energy decreases with the amount of cement that you add to your mixture. That's because it uh, becomes crystallized. Your microstructure becomes crystallized through the cement as far as I'm, I have been explained and it seems understandable to me. And uh, if you still have a liquid uh, moisture in your walls and you will try to annihilate, uh, the cement actually annihilates your moisture content because it sucks up and uses up that moisture, you can't really store energy in it. It decreases. So anyway, uh, in, we either um, have the uh, heating piping applicated on top of the rammed earth and then insulated with some reed mats and then uh, again with some uh, thick mortar, uh, clay mortar. So it's stacked between insulation and mortar and uh, uh, activates uh, the surface of the rammed earth construction, which will be your main uh, storage capacity. Or you can ram them right into the, uh, uh, to the earth, um, layer-wise, uh, and then have them connected after you've finished your wall in the vertical axis. So you can activate parts of it, or the whole thing, or applicate it afterwards, which won't be as effective. That's, well, that went fast. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, more, more, more. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> um, 
Okay, I, I, um, I want to talk a little bit more about erosion. Erosion can be very beautiful. I like this image a lot. Uh, it's free on Wikipedia. You can all have it as your screensaver if you want. <laughs> this is erosion. It's a very natural process. And you see all the stones headed uh, on top. And, you know, it happens for thousands of years and it still stays beautiful. Uh, erosion can have a really nice aesthetic to it. And if you accept that with your wall construction, you'll be quite happy with it. Uh, you can control this uh, erosion with constructive detailing. You don't need to put in your additives uh, with the silicones or what, what, whatever you're using. You can uh, break the speed of erosion, control it, and I've done that for thousands of years. So it's not something that we've ex uh, invented. You know, there's a lot of detailing on, on traditional houses in, in Morocco and in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, some of them seem just, uh, just about aesthetics, but they all have, have their reason of the dividing water, slowing down water, uh, stabilizing corners and all that. And uh, these uh, rammed in tiles that are on Martin's house are, are one of these options. Uh, you do that by placing boards uh, in between those segments when you put up your formwork. Um, the erosion happens in, 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 in certain times and uh, it will stop at a certain point um, and you can just look through that quickly um, and then you'll, you, you'll have your, um, your um, tile stick out in front or the uh, lime puzzle lane checks which I've been talking about which you can also ram directly into your uh, construction without having boards in between your formwork. Uh, what will happen is that after some time there is erosion and this is also on Martin's house. You see that the, the fine particles uh, wash out uh, in between, uh, and you, you, you uh, uh, increase the level of um, stony parts on the outside, and this is where the water will trickle off nicely without uh, eroding further uh, uh, into the wall. Um, the, the, the stuff washes down, goes out here, and then starts to build up uh, more material here. So there's a decrease here and a build up underneath. Uh, nothing really disappears. I mean, there's some stuff that washes all the way down, but uh, in general, um, the softer parts, they swell up and actually seal off your, uh, the, the inner parts of the wall. Uh, this is, was a, after a really heavy rain. You can see this is the weather side of the building and this is the, the, um, the south side. There is hardly any erosion on this side and this is already 15 years, uh, 10 years of erosion on this surface. You see here uh, different ages, 2008, 2010 here, 2012 here. Um, it, it actually has an elegance uh, like um, the first few gray hairs that you get, in my opinion. Uh, the, you, what's also important, uh, connecting different materials uh, with different moisture contents. If you don't stabilize your rammed earth, you can uh, work, uh, especially with wood, really well. You can get nearly a jointless uh, seam uh, between them. You can uh, stuff in more material if you want the joints to disappear more. Um, it's easy to work in and you just activate it by making it moist. Um, this is uh, a technique Martin really likes. This is a, like a coconut hair um, which you uh, uh, damp into to clay mortar and you just stuff it in. It insulates well. And the thing is that uh, your uh, unstabilized rammed earth will always take the moisture out of the wood. So if this wood gets moist, your, uh, your rammed earth will actually suck that moisture off and conserve uh, the wood uh, perfectly. Um, that has been also really working for a lot of people a long time ago also, the timber-framed houses and, you know, some of them are hundreds of years old in uh, Europe. And I think they even started building some here. Anyway, um, more projects. Uh, this uh, is a, re a project of, uh, uh, of uh, great uh, participation rate. Uh, it was a, um, a cinema club and they wanted to convert their old uh, cinema into something more public and nice and they, um, they uh, did most of this by themselves uh, and we just supervised it and uh, put up the formwork with them and taught them to ram a few things and uh, yeah, uh, they did this all in, in, by themselves. The ramming itself is actually a technique which is easily taught and can be done quickly. Uh, can, not, cannot be done quickly, but can be done with even very unskilled workers. 
Okay, uh, labor is expensive, so um, Martin was thinking about uh, half mechanizing uh, processes, and uh, he's done that quite successfully. Um, on my video talk yesterday evening, I, I already said that uh, we're on uh, uh, version five of our robot, um, so it's been uh, going crazy, actually. Um, this was also a very early project, 1998 to 1999. Uh, the first type of prefab the construction Martin did. It's a hypocaust wall. It has cavities uh, in the vertical axis uh, in it, but it's still made of blocks. And these uh, cavities or these uh, uh, tunnels, vertical tunnels, um, they uh, are used for an air circulation system uh, that will either cool or heat your elements. Very simple. There's no uh, piping involved. It's just uh, moving air. How were the cavities uh, created? <laughs> they were uh, created with a sleeving formwork that was uh, pulled up while you were ramming it. So they're not pure, perfectly squ squared, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, that's how it was done. They were prefabbed here uh, in the workshop uh, uh, in, and then transported all the way through um, uh, Austria from one side to the other side. Uh, here you can see uh, the system of how it worked. There was cool air channels and there was warm air channels and you could just uh, use any of those channels, also use some of the channels for installation uh, purposes that might have, uh, need, uh, there were, might, might have been a need for adaption later on concerning the uses uh, within the rooms. Um, lifting those elements uh, is also something that's really to be thought of. It, it involves lots of logistics and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, helping mechanisms that need to be invented. There's nothing that you can really buy off uh, as, you know, uh, commercially. That's a finished building. Uh, and adaption, uh, adaption of buildings, um, also something that works well with prefabrication because uh, once they change the roof, you can put your elements in this way. Uh, and when they close it up again, uh, you already have your stuff inside and it goes within one uh, or two days. And then once inside, you join them up together, make them seamless or jointless. And uh, in this way, uh, this here is a furnace. It has uh, heating pipes inside and thermally activates the whole thing. Um, so in that way, uh, you can uh, um, you know, have, you, have your storage capacity and your uh, climate adaptive elements inside there. And it has a certain aesthetic value also. So this is what the prefab elements looked like for that project. Um, you have to keep them in a certain sizing for transportation and, and lifting and all that. And that's what it looks in a finished state. Then uh, bigger projects. There's always a lot of technical work involved and we try to work with architects as soon as possible as them when they make their first lines because uh, they don't know a whole lot and that's okay. Uh, but if, uh, if they, if they want to know more, then they better get involved with us as soon as possible. And I think uh, architects here and builders here have experienced that it's a very productive process if you do that. And uh, we encourage that. And uh, I'm an architect too. And uh, so uh, there's a way of you know, dialogue that's quick. <laughs> uh, this was the framework for this uh, school project. Uh, that was the first kind of uh, systemized production system. Um, uh, you, know, you, you cut up your uh, facades uh, in the blocks that you think are adequate. And uh, then you get your formwork up. This was a double-sided formwork. You could uh, lift the left part and the right side uh, off, and in that way produce on two sides. And then uh, there's a lot about labeling and getting the logistics right. You need to know which part is at what situation, in what condition at all times, because if someone drops out of your um, um, uh, construction team, there will be you know, only a few hours to explain, OK, you're at that segment, and you need to get those pieces, and they're there and there, and you better get going fast. Um, transportation, lifting, you have to switch the lifting systems. We have uh, boards underneath when you were producing and then you can lift that with your forklift but once, once you want to stack them on top of each other you don't want to have that board underneath it. So you better get the thing lifted without uh, having that board underneath it. So that's uh, how this works and uh, it's not all certified. Uh, that's what the building looked like just after construction and with over time, snow and rain and all that, 
And I just want to say that the eave or the, 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 the four roof is not all too big on these. It's, you know, it, it works fine. Uh, it's been working fine since the time of construction. These are erosion checks here at the corner that help to stabilize it. And this is, these were just recent pictures from uh, um, September, uh, actually. Yeah, this is another project, um, also prefabricated, uh, made of blocks. Uh, probably one of the more famous or more public, uh, published uh, projects. Um, this is an aerial view. There was some material that came right next to the building site. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it has an eight kilometer radius but where, where the production site, the materials came from, and where the building is. So within that radius, we could get all the resources there and, uh, and have everything produced there. And uh, even our uh, construction uh, team could uh, live within that radius. That's the building in its total. It's 110 meters long, 20 meters wide, and uh, mm, I think nine meters high. And this, this is where Martin had developed uh, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, first robot also um, and, and half mechanized the uh, production process. There's still people involved to, to optimize the quality, uh, but um, the heavy work of holding the handheld rammer could be partially um, you know, reduced and also the controlled uh, way of bringing in material and doing your layering right and doing your quality right um, could uh, be you know, optimized with this, uh, this machine. So this was level one, and uh, now we're up to level uh, four of the, this machine. It produces uh, 80 meter, in this case, 80 meter long wall, which then was cut up into pieces. Um, and uh, you'll have up to 4.6 ton heavy elements. Uh, then you need to uh, uh, do your uh, nut and key system so that you can nicely fit them together, which is done manually afterwards. And then you have them all stored and all labeled and all dried. And then you get them lifted, uh, which at that case became a, quite a challenge. Uh, and then uh, you need to get your, your, your uh, construction going quick, quick enough so that you can always work in good weather. But you, since you have that storage capacity, you can react to the weather, changing weather. You know, you can say, okay, we'll have three intensive days and then we'll have a day off because that's when it's raining. So the construction is uh, a steel uh, column and beam uh, construction uh, because uh, the walls weren't allowed to be calculated load bearing, but they are load bearing by itself. Uh, so there's uh, freestanding and just anchored back and uh, the joints disappear afterwards. Yeah, I'm gonna skip this project because I'm running out of time, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, I just give some words. Uh, this was a project where Stephen Dobson also was uh, 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 called as a, in a cons uh, to, to apply and, 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 and uh, uh, consult, and he said, I can't do it, but if someone can do it, then it's Martin. So that's why Martin came into this uh, project. And we worked with uh, the local workers there. We didn't bring in our robot. Uh, there was uh, 150 Pakistani replacing uh, the robot. And we only had a team of uh, six uh, foremen uh, to do the shifts and the quality control. They spent uh, eight months in, in, uh, uh, at the site and uh, had a really great time because they were living in the Hilton. So uh, we, we did the controlled uh, uh, um, uh, pouring in of the material with these tilting um, buckets. Uh, you always fill to the right level, and in that way we got fair, fair quality. Otherwise, the other things of doing uh, are just the same there. The retouching uh, was easily taught. Uh, the mounting had its difficulties, of course, but... Uh, it was all done, and you produce uh, you know, 200 meter uh, long walls, seamless, and uh, quite nice, actually. All right, and makes a lot of people happy. Uh, uh, they always have a good time, the boys. Uh, I go there also sometimes if I get fed up in front of the computer and, and work with them. <laughs>